Welcome. It's still a bit breathtaking to think back to the years of the late 1980s and early 1990s. If the winds of change were sweeping across Africa in the early 1960s or even earlier in the 1950s, in the late 80s and early 90s, they seem to affect the whole globe. To Americans raised on the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the satellite regimes of East Europe, symbolized perhaps above all by the literal collapse of the Berlin Wall, was almost unbelievable and certainly unpredicted. It's true, it was not predicted. Uh, in, in virtually any quarter, uh, liberals thought that Better, for better or worse, the Soviet Union was here to stay and you'd better learn to coexist with it, else we'll blow up the whole world. Conservatives considered it the evil empire, uh, constantly expanding its strength and uh, perhaps installing new bases uh, in, in the new uh, world, in the Western Hemisphere like Nicaragua. It's actually only on the far intellectual right, people like Milton Friedman, who predicted that the Soviet experiment would, would collapse of its, of its own weight. It's food for thought. In any case, the other parts of the world uh, involved in this rising tide of democracy and call it what it was, freedom, certainly included Latin America and not least our own focus, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now the international context of the late 80s and 90s is important for our African case in two main ways. First, through the inspirational power of example. If they can do it, people ask, why can't we? Just as India in the late 40s, becoming independent, 1947, 48, served as a, a model of inspiration for the aspirations uh, for independence in, in Africa, we see something similar uh, in the dynamic at this point. And secondly, the international context was important uh, in, in the more mundane form of pressure from international donors uh, upon which many African regimes had become dependent. Okay, let's begin though with the, the more exciting uh, stuff, the internal pressures generated by African citizens themselves against their authoritarian rulers. I will rely substantially uh, here on the masterful synthesis of the whole process in a book called Democratic Experiments in Africa by Michael Bratton and Nick Vandewal. Michael Bratton grew up in southern Rhodesia, uh, which became Rhodesia. He left that country uh, rather than be drafted to be a soldier in Ian Smith's army uh, and uh, began his research at the same time I was, uh, next door in Zambia. Since then, he's conducted uh, ongoing political science research in many countries in Africa. I don't know anybody with a better grip, a better understanding, a more encyclopedic knowledge, and I'm going to depend on him. Okay, they develop in this, this book a, a prototypical succession of steps seen in country after country between about 1989 and 1994. And I'd like to to summarize them uh, for you. The preconditions are the economic crisis, uh, or the precondition is the economic crisis surveyed in our last lecture, as well as the generalized, deepening crisis of legitimacy facing African rulers as the 1980s progressed. People had simply lost faith that their leaders could deliver anymore, that they could solve their problems or offer them a better life, or even worse, that they were very much trying. They are living high on the hog while we suffer. The second step then follows from the first. Widespread popular protests broke out, again, in country after country, some of the very first in the West African country of Benin, formerly known as Dahomey. Protests break out mainly over economic grievances, above all the erosion of purchasing power. Another way, I suppose, of looking at the terms of trade. What do I have to pay to get a loaf of bread? 
Students shut down universities over bursaries which left them literally hungry. Trade unions and civil servants struck over pay holdups and freezes. Market women demonstrated over imposed price, uh, price freezes. Almost entirely, the protests were urban rather than rural in base. That probably shouldn't surprise us. Cities, after all, since the wave of strikes that we looked at a few lectures back in the 1930s and 40s, and which very much preconditioned the rise of nationalism, cities had been where the action was. Okay, their third step then is that the authoritarian rulers responded in the usual fashion, which I would characterize as crack down and or buy off. That is, use a lot of stick, but also some carrot. But the critical difference this time around was that the constricted economy limited the resources with which the authoritarian rulers could do either of these things, either crack down or especially buy off. The protests, therefore, did not abate. Instead, and here's their fourth step, they took on an increasingly politicized and aggressive character. People, again, often inspired by the sense of possibility which the international context offered, began to fashion genuine visions of alternatives. Maybe it doesn't have to be this way. At a minimum, and most importantly, in many people's minds, this called for an end to political monopolies, whether those took the form of the one-party states or they took the form of the military governments usually created by military coups. The next step in the, in the developing dialectic was political liberalization by the rulers. Okay, we'll end the government monopoly of all the media. We'll allow the discussion of a return, uh, just talk about it at least, of a return to multi-party competition. We'll control, we can control still, and limit the process. We can palliate the uh, dissension again we can let the steam off a bit. It rarely seems to work that way, as we've seen before. When the British and French uh, reformed their empires, soon enough they lost them. When the Soviet Union began its process of reform, uh, it was the beginning of the end. The opposition took due advantage of the openings, often by organizing the ubiquitous national conference. And you see this, this, a form of this happening again in country after, after country. It's usually a gathering of all manner of representatives from what a lot of people call civil society. That is from uh, organizations, uh, you know, women's organizations, cooperatives, uh, the Boy Scouts, uh, certainly churches, um, trade unions, uh, and, and so on. And they're usually presided over by figures with uh, a sort of an above-it-all kind of, of status, sort of unassailable status, quite often religious uh, figures, a bishop, for instance, whom um, by virtue of their own virtue and by virtue of their position uh, is less likely to wind up uh, being uh, arrested, for instance. So these conferences actually drafted, in many cases, uh, alternative constitutions. Sometimes they even declared themselves to be, to be sovereign. Again, like some of the things that took place in the 1950s, these were enormously exciting uh, gatherings, assemblies of people to uh, their, their, their participants. I, I think of uh, a scholar like Georges Nzongola and Talaja, based at Howard University, but originally from uh, from the Congo and the author of a, a number of works on, on Congolese uh, history. And his own excitement in taking part in the early 1990s at a national convention in where else? Mobutu's uh, Zaire uh, at, that, at that time. And even though the subsequent history is certainly not uh, turned in terribly positive directions, Nzongolo certainly will make the case that this was a permanent contribution to what must eventually come in his home country. He'll argue, for instance, that merely the testimony that they gathered day after day after day of how the Mobutu regime actually worked uh, 
will in the long run prove valuable. Okay, at this point, we should step back and again return to the international context. With the collapse of the Soviet Union came, of course, the effective end of the Cold War. And we've seen in previous lectures just how important the Cold War context could be in a place like the Belgian Congo, in a place like, uh, like, the, uh, like Angola, excuse me. African leaders, with the uh, disappearance of this Cold War context, could no longer simply proclaim their Marxism-Leninism, for instance, and expect aid from the Soviet Union, uh, as Augustine Neto and the MPLA government in Angola, for instance, could. They could no longer proclaim their adherence to capitalism and anti-communism, as Mobutu in, in Zaire did, or as Jonas Savimbi, the would-be president, the rebel leader in, in UNITA, uh, the UNITA movement in Angola did, they couldn't simply proclaim their anti-communism and automatically expect uh, aid from, from the West. So this uh, definitely reduces the options available to, uh, to Africa's leaders. With the collapse of the Soviet bloc, assistance from the West became essentially the only game in town. We go from what they would have called a bipolar uh, world to essentially a monopolar world. There's one superpower, uh, the United States, very much allied with uh, the economic union, uh, the European Union uh, in, in Europe, obviously. And essentially, that's where one has to turn. In this respect, the structural adjustment programs, the SAPs of the institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and which we looked at at the close of the last lecture, in this new context, the SAP option, with it being or becoming essentially the only game in town, looms that much larger. Now, on the surface, it's slightly hard to believe that the policymakers of the IMF and the World Bank, on one hand, and struggling urban Africans, on the other, would share an agenda. But in some respects, they did. The donors were interested in, were concerned, uh, mainly about the sheer inefficiency in basic economic performance uh, measurement, the sheer inefficiency of corrupt and closed regimes. The people, on the other hand, if I can say that, said, damn right, open them up. We agree, these closed and corrupt regimes can no longer deliver, let's get something in their place. So, various degrees of political conditionality were increasingly a part of the SAP packages, the Structural Adjustment Programs. In other words, it isn't simply lower the tariff barriers or balance your budget or devalue your currency. Now, the lenders of last resort are insisting on multi-party elections. They're insisting on uh, removing the curbs on media and allowing publication of, of independent newspapers, uh, in some cases even broadcasting uh, being uh, opened up as well. So these features, the end of the Cold War, the political accountability criteria uh, beginning to be added to the structural adjustment programs are aspects of this international context which certainly made a difference in the democratization movements that we are discussing. That said, Bratton and Van de Waal conclude, and I agree, that these international pressures, though important, were secondary to the domestic one, secondary to the ones generated uh, from the populations themselves. In any case, all over Africa, and I do mean all over Africa, one party and military regimes eventually conceded the inevitability of multi-party elections, which were duly held. In a lot of respects, that moment coming in the early 90s, in most cases, 
was the moment of the high tide, the peak tide of these democratization moments, uh, movements. After them, things become less clear, the water muddies again, we shouldn't expect a fairy tale, and we don't get one. Now, yet again, let me illustrate from my first love, and that is Zambia. By the late 1980s, Zambia was, to be blunt, a mess. An economic basket case. We might say that it was on life support, except there was very little support coming through the tubes, the IV. People had lost their patience with Kenneth Kaunda's regime. A nice man, maybe, but we have had it. I can give you two illustrations of this, one urban and one rural. I was in Zambia in 1989, conducting research, and for a time uh, I lived uh, in a hostel attached across the road from the University of Zambia, um, which by that time had, I'm sad to say, become a shadow of that gleaming new citadel of learning that represented the hopes of the whole generation and the whole country when it was built in the, in the 1960s. In any case, I'm living amongst a, a group essentially of uh, graduate students at, um, at the university, of, of young lecturers, uh, very bright people um, indeed. Uh, most of us took our rather humble meals in the, uh, the hostel's uh, dining hall. Uh, each evening, and most people, there wasn't a whole lot to do, uh, retired to the, the lounge to, to watch a little bit of TV on the one black and white television that, uh, that we had at this, at this hostel. Um, on most evenings, the news, which of course was controlled by the government, uh, controlled by the one party, allowed to be uh, legally in existence and to control the government, the news um, usually included and turned to uh, President Kaunda's message for the day or his activities of the day or what have you. And time after time when that stage came, these young people simply got up and, and left. They didn't throw things at the television. They didn't curse it or curse him. I suspect because on one hand, for some lingering respect that they still had for uh, a guy who did retain uh, a fundamental sense of, of decency throughout, and secondly, because it had perhaps become increasingly dangerous to, to take aggressive anti kaunda stances. Let me give you a rural example, though. Down in southern Zambia, uh, amongst the, the village folk that I have been visiting for 30 years or so, if you're visiting down there um, and you take a, a nice meal pr uh, produced, um, usually it has to be said by the, uh, the women of a particular household, a meal of nshuma, let's say, that thick uh, porridge based on, on ground cornmeal and some nice jishu, some sauce, perhaps it's made from nyama, or meat, or madede, uh, tomatoes, or nkugu, chicken. After you've finished a meal like that, uh, the proper thing to say, the polite thing to say, uh, is to say twakuta, and in fact you might even sort of rub your belly a bit. Uh, twakuta means ah, satisfying, I'm full, thank you, you know, it's, it's a form of, of courtesy, it's a form of, of etiquette, twakuta, I'm full. People by 1989 were muttering twakuta in a very different context. And the closest translation would be, we're fed up. We've had a belly full of kaunda. We've had a belly full of one party rule, uh, and so on. So, true to the, the model uh, proposed by uh, Bratton and, and Van der Waal, protests begin to erupt again, particularly in the cities, especially uh, what were usually called food riots, when the subsidies were removed on staples, particularly, again, the staple at this point in Zambia's history, obviously 
maize meal or maize cornmeal. And bear in mind that the removal of the subsidies on this is often in response to the uh, prescriptions of the structural adjustment programs, which calls for market, uh, you know, allowing the price of, of cornmeal to, to rise to, you know, its economic level and so forth. So the notion of subsidizing urban consumption is often lifted as a part of, as one of the conditions of obtaining uh, assistance from uh, external donors. But of course, perhaps predictably, this turns around and has consequences in terms of discontent and the eruption of protests. Indeed, by the, light, uh, the late 80s, we have a couple of instances where Kaunda is able to stay in power uh, by repelling or repulsing uh, attempts at military coup. Now, heavily dependent on foreign assistant at this po assistance at this point, Kaunda had little chance uh, little choice but to listen to Western encouragement of liberalization, including the encouragement that came from his friend, uh, Jimmy Carter, who, as we know, has remained quite active in international affairs uh, since his um, retirement from uh, the presidency. And indeed, they are friends. They, they share some things. They both have lost presidency, although Kaunda had a considerably longer run at it than than Carter, but I think the real basis for their friendship, uh, frankly, is is very simple. It's it's a shared, uh, quite deep and sincere Christianity. Now the opposition in Zambia coalesced around the perfectly named Movement for Multi-Party Democracy, the MMD, the Movement for Multi-Party Democracy, which was led by the diminutive trade unionist Frederick uh, Chaluba. Chaluba occupied then the head of what had always been, from the 1930s on, a strategic point of power, and that is the apex of workers' organizations. After all, in the critical industries like copper, organized workers obviously wield a very considerable measure of, of influence and power, and Chaluba had used that, a trade union position, to gradually expand his own agenda and his own visions and was uh, supported by many for, for, for doing so. I said diminutive. Uh, Chaluba is quite the opposite from uh, figures like uh, Joshua Nkomo in Zimbabwe or Jonas Savimi in, uh, in uh, Angola. He stands barely five feet tall, but believe me, he loomed large uh, at that moment, articulating again and again the necessity for change and change now. Somebody gave me a, a t-shirt uh, from the, the early 90s in Zambia, which is an MMD t-shirt and has a picture of Chaluba on one side. And on the other side, it has a picture of a clock. And the, uh, the minute hand is up there at about 58 or 59. And uh, it says, the hour has come. The hour has come. And that was their, their mantra, uh, repeated again and again. Now is the time to open this system up, the movement for multi-party democracy. And finally, in 1991, elections were, were held. Kaunda, and this is uh, a precursor to a phenomenon we'll see in our 35th lecture on Zimbabwe and, and Robert Mugabe, Kaunda actually believed that he'd, he'd prevail. You know, he was the father of the nation. We sometimes uh, lose sight of the fact of how isolated from reality leaders can become. Sometimes people talk about, you know, the isolation of the Oval Office in the case of American politics or what have you. But it's true that leaders can often be surrounded by, by people who tell them the good news and tell them that the people are still behind them and so forth. And Kaunda... Uh, in a lot of respects, was genuinely shocked when the results of this election, which international observers, by and large, pronounced to be free and fair, uh, came in. The electorate had rejected Kaunda after 27 years in power and elected none other than Frederick Chaluba by a margin, and it is a staggering margin, of 4 to 1, 80% to 20% against Kaunda the father of the nation, and replacing him with 
Frederick Chaluba. Now, to his everlasting credit, Kaunda accepted the verdict. He didn't cancel the election, you know, after it's gone on for several hours or after the returns are coming in. And that certainly has happened in other places. He didn't decide that it had been fraudulent, which would be hard to do since his own government organized it in many respects. He accepted it, and he went gracefully, and he offered his successor the best. Like Carter, Kaunda has remained active, and in fact, his stock has risen again in Zambia in the decade and a half or something like that since he was uh, thrown out of office. Many people, uh, precisely because his incumbent proved more corrupt than anybody in Kaunda's regime, have taken to reminiscing a bit about the good old days under Kaunda, something that would have been unthinkable in the late 80s. And it is sad to say that Chaluba uh, began a, a very hopeful uh, moment in Zambia's uh, history and allowed it or turned it himself quite sour. He has, in fact, in the last couple of years, uh, actually been arrested and charged with corruption. He is out on what we would call bail uh, at this point. It remains to be seen whether those uh, charges will, will materialize or not. Okay, well, some might say, you know, looking at Zambia or, or elsewhere in Africa, that the democratic moment came and that it went. That we had a sort of return to the, the status quo ante. Now, to be sure, this revolution of rising expectations, or maybe we should call it revolution of rising expectations too. Uh, it's the second democratic uh, revolution in in recent African history. Like the first one, the one that, of course, revolved around the gaining of independence, this revolution has met with much disappointment. Some leaders held on to power, manipulating the very reforms they permitted. In other cases, as I've just mentioned, a figure like Chaluba proved worse than the old, uh, once in power. And also, we might pause here to say that freedom can mean uh, many things. Uh, as in the Soviet Union, freedom uh, from the old regime of, of the Communist Party dictatorship certainly opened up a lot of things that we recognize as, as democratic or libertarian or what have you. But freedom has also resulted in, in the Soviet Union, as I think a lot of the, the former Soviet Union, uh, in a place like Russia, as I think a lot of Russians could tell you, uh, and the freedom to swindle, the freedom to hustle, the freedom to cheat. You know, you, you have a greater scope to sort of act the part of the confidence man once the, the party monopoly on things is, is no longer in, in place. People in southern Zambia, for instance, the farmers whom I've been talking about, they used to curse at the inefficiency and the slowness and so forth of the, the government-owned marketing boards who would collect the, the maize from them or the cotton or what have you, but, you know, they'd get there late and some of it would spoil or the checks that they were promised didn't come uh, and, and so forth and so on. And at first, this seemed like a great alternative, you know, the, those boards are gone. We have the, the, the marketing um, uh, uh, operations are now in private hands. but. They then found, of course, that they'd have guys who would show up in trucks, take the, uh, the maize, uh, promise payment one sort or another, and issue them counterfeit stuff or simply disappear with the, uh, the you know, come in and, and, and spirit it off in the middle of the night and so forth. So freedom is great stuff, but it can take a lot of, of unpredicted and not always positive turns. Okay. We can be as disappointed as we like, but it's almost true to say that today there is not a single official one-party state or military government left in Africa. In places like Zambia, people and parties compete for power with a tolerance that was unthinkable even a little while ago. People are less likely to acquiesce in corruption. There's a lively, free and critical press.
they're le less likely to accept misrule. I doubt that they will go back. No, it wasn't a fairy tale, but the democratization movements were a courageous step forward and should be recognized as such. Thank you.